Unraveled is a play about creativity and frontotemporal dementia and about love. Over the last few years, I've had the privilege of being able to work with Dr. Bruce Miller and Dr. Bill Seeley and Dr. Adit Friedberg about creativity and FTD and learned more about how they relate to each other. And um, kind of reached a peak of artistic output and creativity years before her first neurological symptoms, um, before she began to have trouble expressing herself in words. Other systems in the brain seemed to become intensified. What we found is that w while the language areas, especially in the left frontal lobe, uh, were, were shrinking, the visual and spatial association areas in the right parietal neocortex were actually seeming to get bigger. And um, it turns out that those systems are actually in a sort of dynamic equilibrium with each other. We, we had a long history of describing uh, a surprising artistic uh, emergence in the setting of uh, the FTD population, but we never really understood mechanistically why that happened. In the case of Anne, we had uh, the fortune of uh, having a brilliant artist uh, who uh, we also had images of just when that artistic uh, creativity began. So seeing uh, her images, Bill Seeley was able to put together a, a really phenomenally interesting story which showed that before Anne had actually manifested her progressive language disturbance, a progressive aphasia, she already had a very small uh, left uh, opercular region. This is the part of the brain that Broca described. It's the part of the brain that allows uh, speech and language to occur. So a few years uh, before she produced Unraveled, she was showing atrophy in this very critical language area. At the same time, Anne had been uh, become obsessed with painting. With this painting, we saw a large uh, right parietal lobe, uh, statistically larger than 30 age match controls. And what it suggested to us was that as that language area was slowly atrophying, losing function, uh, Anne was activating another part of the brain uh, to compensate, uh, and this part of the brain was involved with visual creativity. Uh, uh, really an extraordinary combination of findings that I think tell a, a much larger story about the uh, degenerative diseases. The biggest battle that people seem to be fighting in this disease is one of isolation and the inability to communicate. What this exploration teaches us is that there is tremendous flexibility of mind there's the ability for transmodal communication. Somebody who can't speak something might be able to draw it. You don't have to be an artist to be able to communicate what you'd like for dinner with a drawing instead of a word. And if a caregiver is open to that or nurtures that, that could keep people connected for longer. What I've learned from these folks is that there is a shift in the way of thinking about this disease. She had already made the connection between herself and Ravel by the time I met her, um, because she had um, learned uh, that he too had undergone a sort of progressive illness that um, may have influenced the way he um, perceived and um, tried to capture the, the world in a different art form. Um, in, in his music. One remarkable thing about Anne's story is her obsession with Bolero. And, and this uh, opens another story uh, regarding Ravel. So about three years before Ravel produced Bolero, he was uh, beginning to worry about his uh, psychological state. 
Um, he was very unhappy with a piece of music that he created that has been beloved uh, for now more than a century. Uh, Jake Broder has captured uh, this remarkable relationship of two distinct people who knew nothing about the other, uh, who were connected across time uh, through this uh, obsession for a remarkable piece of music. Um, I think it tells us something about uh, how the, the way the brain is structured uh, is a determinant of creativity. Um, and there was something very similar uh, about both Anne's brain and Ravel's brain that made them both uh, able to produce these beautiful compositions, one musical, one visual. It, it, it also points out to how different their brains were. For Ravel, it was a musical composition that came out of his progressive aphasia. For Anne, it was a visual composition. So yes, not all people with FTD become artists, but lurking within that uh, very focal degenerative uh, disease, there are strengths that are emerging, and that's the story of Anne and Ravel. The first wave was really just awe that I felt looking at her output. It was so extreme, you know, um, in its quantity and quality, qualities. When analyzing her brain, you know, I was trained to focus on lesions and deficits, and I looked for those and found them, no surprise. By the time I met her, she could hardly speak. You know, the kind of uh, big moment that sort of set us on the next course of thinking and, and exploration was when uh, we decided to look at the brain not for deficits and lesions, but for areas of enhancement or liberation. And that was then, it was like, oh my goodness, there's really something here. And it happened at a moment when we were just beginning to adopt the tools and develop the tools to understand how brain areas are actually in this sort of interplay and how they relate to each other, how they work together, and also how they oppose each other at times. And so that, all of that came together at, at a, within a very short period of time. <laughs> because Anne came already with this understanding of her connection to Ravel, learning about him and his life and the course of events around the time of his death, it just sort of put this whole thing in a massive time warp for me where all of a sudden I could kind of see the connection between them over, you know, a very long period of time. And I often kind of wonder what would happen if they'd traded places, you know, if, if, if she had come first and painted Bolero, would he have composed it to kind of imitate what she had painted? To address this key question, what is the underlying neural mechanism, I led a group study. In a group study, we can search for patterns that are both common and unique to patients with FTD and the emergence of visual artistic creativity. Emergence of visual creativity was occurring in 2.5% of patients with FTD spectrum disorders. It was ever more prevalent about 7% in patients with predominant anterior temporal lobe degeneration. This is remarkable considering that this is a positive gain of function in the brain facing ongoing neuronal death. So in patients with FTD and the emergence of visual uh, creativity, there is this unique positive structural correlation between this dorsal medial occipital visual association region and the cortical region where the right hand is represented. It provided a proof of concept that positive gains of function may not only emerge in the setting of neurodegenerative diseases, but leave their signature in the brain. The Ann Adams case is extreme, but it feels sometimes like the exception that proves the rule, that that asymmetry maybe happens with everybody a little bit. And if so, we can use that to help on the ground every day a little bit right now. So, so Anne and uh, the group of artists that uh, Adit Friedberg studied ha have taught me that many of our patients have a extraordinary strengths. These strengths are driven by who they were before the illness started, but also 
by the losses and gains that happen early in the stages of these diseases. And I think historically in neurology, we've focused on weaknesses. What we must do now is focus on strengths. This gives the caregivers guidance. It gives them hope. Uh, it helps them to understand that this is not only a, a set of diseases associated with losses. It gives hope to the patients as well. It gives them hope that there are incredible capacities that uh, they still possess that will allow them to find meaning in life uh, even with losses. And I think this is really the story of aging more generally. Um, as we lose uh, capacities, uh, we must focus on the gains, the strengths. Um, the, these are the things that make life so meaningful. As clinicians, we need to start thinking about these visual enhancements in the setting of FTD. Together with the patients and their families, we should explore how to leverage these emerging or enhanced capacities to improve quality of life. We've taken only sort of the first small steps in this long journey, I think. And the, those steps have begun to teach us about how in one specific disease we can see one specific form of creativity. What I would love to see is how many different neurological and psychiatric diseases can have an impact on many different forms of creativity because my working assumption or model is that whatever system in the brain is struggling or deteriorating or degenerating or just not working right for whatever reasons that we don't totally understand, there's going to be something with that now that is a change, not necessarily for the worse, but it, uh, that is, it can be what we might call a gain of function, even if it's in the context of a very disabling and debilitating and uh, tragic uh, loss of function. Because I think we all bring in our, in the context of our normal functioning spectrum of, 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 of uh, brain capacity, it's there in all of us. It's there in all of us. And so there's an enormous and profound opportunity to learn about that. I think increasingly we're going to have to diagnose these disorders in the very earliest stages, when they're the first perturbations of abnormality. What that means is that we have to be able to diagnose people even before they are developing uh, functional loss. In Alzheimer's disease, we're going to have to diagnose before there's memory disturbances. In the progressive aphasias, we're going to have to diagnose before language is affected. And I think what we're learning from these uh, functional imaging studies, structural imaging studies, is that before loss is uh, visible, we actually, actually see gains in function. Sometimes this leads to extraordinary products, sometimes it doesn't. But being able to diagnose that critical period when one circuit is turning off but not yet dysfunctional and another circuit is turning on, sometimes associated with great strengths, is going to be, I think, the key to early diagnosis, early intervention, and the medications are coming. Not everybody who has this is going to become an artist. But what is being discovered seems to be pointing towards the idea that there's a little bit of flexibility of communication at the beginning phases of this that can be understood or leaned into by caregivers to help keep lines of communication open for longer. It really has taught me uh, from the minute I see a, a patient and their loved one it, it's really taught me that I have to focus on uh, what are the strengths of that person. No, they may not be an artist, but they may be, uh, have capacity to make a beautiful garden. They may have increased empathy if it's Alzheimer's disease. They may love uh, children in a, in, a, in a very special and unique way. So, so I think more broadly, uh, whether it's a painter, a writer, or uh, someone who uh, gets great satisfaction out of exercise, I, I, I think it's really an exercise in understanding what is strong, what is still present, and what can we work with um, uh, regarding the humanity of that particular person. All this science is all very well and good, 
But the question I hear the most is, how does this relate to people who have the condition or love people who have the condition? What does this mean to everybody now? I, I think this is a larger story about how we're organized as human beings. It's the story of uh, the circuits that we develop and the circuits that uh, we uh, turn off. Uh, it tells us a lot about the visual creative process. So we, we now know that uh, there's specific circuitry in the back of the brain that is uh, critically turned on when someone is in the process of in that visual creative mode. They are thinking visually, they are creating visually, um, but the language circuits in the front of the brain must be turned off for that creativity to emerge. It's possible to find ways to leverage little everyday bits of creativity that can help people living with the condition and their caregivers communicate for longer. This isn't something esoteric that lives far away in the clouds. This is something that everybody, it's a change of perspective that can help a lot of people who are dealing with this in little ways right now. I, Jake, I just want to thank you for um, making us aware of Anne's remarkable story, uh, bringing uh, us awareness about this incredible journey that Robert and Anne took together. It's the story of uh, an individual caregiver and a patient, but it's also a universal story. It's a universal story of all patients and all caregivers. And I think it, it took a great artist like you uh, to make us aware of this um, extraordinary relationship 